Punky Moore, Public Affairs Officer for the Mendocino National Forest, and we're at the North Shore Event Center tonight. We had the Burned Area Emergency Response Team, uh, BEAR for short, uh, give a presentation tonight about the findings they've had on their assessment of the burned area from the ranch fire, and about uh, 70 people attended and had some great questions. We were really, really glad that so many people showed up tonight. Um, my name is Jess Clark, and I'm acting as the Public Affairs Information Public Information Officer for the Bear Team, which I'll talk about what that is in a second here. I wanted to um, introduce uh, the Bear Team real quick and have them introduce who they are, where they're from, just really quickly. Um, so those from the Bear Team. We'll start with Dave Young, our team lead. Hello, Dave Young, zone soil scientist for the Forest Service for Northern California. Bear Team lead. Based out of Maine, correct? Yes. Kyle Wright, off of the shoots in Bend, Oregon. Cassie Hageman, I'm a wildlife biologist here in Upper Lake for the Mendocino. Hilda Kwan, I'm also out of the Upper Lake office. I'm a hydrologist. Thank you. Santino Pasqua, engineer, Mount Baker, Snoqualmie, and Washington. Okay. Any other members of the team here? No. We have a large team. We have competing um, needs going on right now, so that's why I'm all here. I also want to mention we have a sign-up sheet that's an optional course for you to sign into. Um, we're going to pass that around. You can put your name, an email, and or phone number, and there's a checkbox whether you want to be contacted for more information moving forward. That information would come from the forest. So I think you will start passing that around. Um, please sign up if you'd like more information to be included. Um, thankful to Shannon, who's not here tonight, she let us use this facility. She'll be here later. And also, it's nice to have Lake County News here. Appreciate you coming out and participating in this. So what we're going to do tonight is I'm going to give you a brief overview of what the Forest Service is doing in regards to the Burned Area Emergency Response Program for the ranch fire. And, um, you know, I know you guys have been through a heck of a month. Uh, and I want to be sensitive to that and aware of that. I come from Salt Lake City in Utah. We've been getting your smoke, but I haven't had the fire, right? Um, so I haven't had the experiences you guys have had. I'm going to present this stuff in a very scientific, matter-of-fact way, kind of saying, here's what we've assessed, here's what we think might happen. Um, but please don't take that as being insensitive to the experiences you've all been through. I want to acknowledge that up front, so I, I recognize some of you have lost the land. And, um, the lone firefighter fatality on this fire actually came from Utah in the Salt Lake Valley, so I'm aware of the dangers and risks that have been Acknowledge that. So, Kyle, please advance. Kyle, my slide advance for tonight. Thank you, Kyle. Um, is this loud enough, by the way? Can you guys hear me well enough? Okay. And the screen's dark enough. You guys can see it okay? Yeah. Okay. So, the bear process, uh, burn area emergency response. So, most large fires in the United States, and by large I mean like a thousand acres, um, they have a requirement to go out and do an assessment of the burned area. This is for Forest Service lands. And they come in in an emergency response fashion. They're not there to come fix the land. They're here to say, what happened as a result of this fire? What emergencies now exist and how do we fix that? How do we, I use the word fix right there, we're not fixing things. How do we stabilize the land because of this fire? So we look at things we call critical values. An example of that might be a forest road, for example. Uh, that's a value to us. We want to keep roads open, obviously. Because of the fire, what new threats exist um, to this road? And if something happens, if that threat comes to life, comes to fruition, does whatever happens there, does that constitute an emergency condition? And if so, what can we do to prescribe, what treatments can we prescribe to fix that or to, um, to mitigate that risk moving forward? So that's what the Bear Team does. Is we're looking at those kinds of things across the forest. And we're documenting that. We're presenting it to our local line officers, which are Frank and his boss, Andrew Carlson, are in the supervisor's office. And that goes forward um, to a funding request to actually get those treatment prescriptions implemented across the forest. So that's kind of in a nutshell what we're doing. We're looking for emergency treatments uh, that are very minimal and they're temporary, just trying to stabilize the land to minimize the risks out there to critical. So bear teams are they're not um, formal teams in the sense of like they're always established like an incident management team is. They're very ad hoc. 
a good team leader like Dave Young, and he reaches out and looks for people who can come and assist. And they get people from a variety of resources and disciplines. We've got people who do mapping stuff. We've got hydrologists like Hilda. We've got wildlife people um, and botanists who are interested in plants and invasive weeds. Um, we've got soil scientists interested in erosion, geologists with debris flows, um, a whole archaeologists and engineers and recreation people. So we've got all of those disciplines represented on this team that are here to look at what happened um, on the Mendocino National Forest as a result of this fire. And we spend lots of time in the field. We go out to the forest, we drive through, we hike through, we flew over, flew over today, we got an aerial view of part of the fire today. So we're looking at it closely based off of that dis the discipline that we're, um, we're over. Next slide, Kyle. One of the things, when you see the news about a fire, what you typically see is the reporting on the fire intensity. You'll hear, see news headlines or hear news that say, 200-foot um, flame lengths, and it, it burned this many acres today, and it, it went, have you seen, ever seen fire activity like this and fire behavior like this? That's usually referring to fire intensity, what kind of happened to the forest above the ground. One of the first things that a bear team does is looks at the soil severity, so what happened at the surface of the forest floor and a few inches beneath the surface. How, how bad did that fire, when it came through, did it sit there? Was there a lot of fuel there? Did it just did it reside there for a while and then cook the soil? Did it consume the fine roots? Did it, uh, if you were to take your hand in the dirt, would it come up as a clump? Or would it come up like sand and just kind of crumble through your fingers? So how's the structure now? How strong is that soil uh, below the surface right there? Those are things we're looking at, we're not so much looking at the fire intensity, the above ground effects, as much as we are from the soil effects, because that plays a pretty important role into our analysis moving forward. These days, with technologies out there, um, every bear team pretty much uh, gets a head start on their assessment from satellite technology. And we get um, satellites that float over a fire before it happens, so a pre-fire condition. And then you get a second satellite image that comes over after, or in this case, during the fire. You can see active fire on the top of this right here with smoke blowing up to the, the north. So we look at a pre-fire condition, we look at our post-fire condition, and we can kind of do a, a differencing. You can kind of analyze the difference between those two time periods and get a good estimate of the severity of that fire. Grant that's from space. So then we can all everybody, everybody in the field, the soil scientists, to go out and analyze that from the ground perspective. And that's one of the first things, as I said, we do as a team is get on the ground and start digging through the dirt. We look to see if the litter and duff, the organic material at the surface, did that get consumed? Are there needles still on the trees? Are they brown or are they green? That matters. Brown needles will fall and create cover, for example. They dig holes, the soil scientists do, little, small little holes, and they actually test for hydrophobicity or water repellency. So if they uh, put a little drop of water on the soil, is it going to percolate into the soil or is it going to beat up and sit there? And that's an important factor they're looking at as well, is how long will water sit? Because if it's on a slope and it beats up, it doesn't sit, it runs off and goes somewhere else, and that's what um, leads to some flooding events. For example. So looking at all these things, you see them the impact soil burn severity has on a variety of different um, aspects of watershed response, we call it. Flooding potential, debris flow hazards, soil erosion, how fast vegetation recovers. So for example, if the soil really cooked, did it cook the seed bank instead? Did it make the soil unproductive for future germination of, uh, short-term germination of, <coughs> of plants and vegetation? So it's a pretty critical thing. And that's one of the very first things that we, we've done. One thing you'll notice is when we did this, uh, the fire was so active and so big, and this is a, quote, mega fire, um, 410,000 acres or so, we couldn't even get to the top half of the fire, the north half. It wouldn't let us get in there. We were not actively fighting, we are just assessing. So we actually uh, made a decision to cut off the southern half of the fire ranch fire here, and we cut off by a watershed boundary so we could do some scientific models on that, that area of interest. Um, so that's what you see on these maps here. We are currently engaged in the north half assessment as we speak. I mean, the helicopter flight they took today was in the northern half. And people have been in the field all day and all week driving through and checking northern half. 
but we're only talking time about the southern half, we call it the phase one assessment area. And you can see, here's the results of our soil burn severity. I want you to note that when you drive through the forest, you'll see a lot of black sticks. You'll see um, consumed vegetation. It looks like, in some cases, it looks very bleak. Um, and that's gonna happen on every fire. But you'll see a lot of great spots as well, spots with a pretty healthy mosaic of burn. And the soil burn severity, the map you see here, um, it doesn't necessarily relate directly to vegetation severity. Just know that, so that, that plays an important role, like I said, in our models. One thing you will know is the percentages of high and moderate together. Uh, I believe that's 65, I shouldn't do math live, but 65% is moderate and high severity. That's a pretty high number when you combine those two classes. Um, especially that, that amount of moderate severity. We don't see that percentage very regularly on the fire. Um, but low high severity is pretty common for what we look at in this environment. One of the first things we do, once we finish that soil burn severity map, we actually send it off to the USGS in Denver. And they have some landslide modeling they do for debris flows. So we send that layer to them. It's a, called a GIS, a mapping layer. And they feed it into some fancy models that I don't understand, I'm not a geologist. And they send back a, a probability for debris flows. And we looked at it, it's tough to see maybe on this map, but um, there's different probabilities, 0 to 40, 40 to 80, 80 to 100%. Um, those red segments were high probability for debris flows. I'm in your way, I'm sorry. Um, our geologists, as they were walking through the fire, and they, they saw these results, they were kind of surprised by the model results because they hadn't seen that kind of potential from the ground. So we decided to dig into it some more and look at other aspects of watershed response. One of the first things we did after that was to look at um, probability for soil erosion. And this takes into account things like the slope of the mountain, the soil type, the length of the hill slope, and the severity of the soil in that area. And then we create some models that show tons per acre coming off um, the mountain in a certain kind of storm scenario. And this was not very crazy. Uh, these results were pretty standard results that we've seen. In fact, some cases lower than other fires we've seen by far. Um, nothing that really gave us some serious pause. So we're excited to hear that actually and see that maybe the soil erosion wasn't going to be as dramatic as we first thought. And it's not as dramatic as you think as you drove through it. Because you see black sticks standing there, but it's not as, as severe based off of these model results. So then we also um, had our hydrologists look at this some more and said, let's, let's talk about flood potential here. So they ran through some models to say, based off of the climate scenario here in Lucerne um, and this area, um, Lucerne, Nice, and Upper Lake, and based off a certain storm scenario, what might we expect from our flooding potential? And as you see, the, the top five or six watersheds, we've got the results on the screen here, and uh, on the far right, it shows magnitude of change. Uh, 1.0 is normal, or pre-fire conditions, of what we expect normally to happen. 1.63 is basically 63% higher than normal. It's not even twice, not even double what we'd expect. So that actually was encouraging to see that uh, we weren't even expecting <coughs> twice as much discharge in the stream from water runoff as we would normally um, without a fire coming through. So again, more encouraging news that, that we saw from the water response. Certainly, not to say there won't be things that happen. You could have a crazy storm come through and dump a lot of rain in a short amount of time and this would be exceeded. It's, this is a model, right? So one of the things we do is when we're looking at soil erosion and the flood potential is one of the treatment prescriptions we might prescribe to the local line officers is a, is a hill slope treatment we call, like mulching, for example, or in other parts of the country, maybe some seed, to make some native seeds to germinate there. Um, next slide. To do that, though, we, we, we do some analysis to make sure it makes sense. And a lot of places this fire didn't make sense to do that. So a couple things we look at. We don't treat unburned or low severity spots in the fire. It doesn't make sense. They're fine, right? They're gonna either nothing happened or they will recover quickly. We also don't treat flat ground. By flat, I mean 0 to 20% slope. Because if rain comes, it's not gonna wash a lot of stuff off. We also have found, for many years of treatment effective, uh, treatment monitoring, 
is that steep slopes, greater than 60%, it's not very effective to drop something like mulch on a hill slope. It rolls off, blows off, washes off in the next rain. So we don't typically treat those either. So on the map here, the red you see is the intersection of all those three things. Unburned or low, flat, or really steep. So we kind of pull those out of consideration for treatments. We don't really prescribe hill slope, like mulch treatments in those areas. There are still options available on there. Um, but we looked at, like for example, Middle Creek, because it has some non-red spots on that map. Um, but the areas we could actually treat were pretty small. It made a very minimal impact on the overall watershed response of Middle Creek, <coughs> so we elected not to prescribe that. So as I mentioned, as we go through the burn scar, we've been driving through it for two weeks now, and this particular bear team has, and we're seeing a lot of different different results and different uh, reactions to this fire. Some high spots, some moderate spots, some unburned spots, some nice mosaic spots, some very healthy um, burn spots as well. And then we're already seeing this. So you have no rain on this fire for months, or in this, this area for months from what I gather, at least one month, right? Um, and longer than that. So we've had a really shortage of rain here. But even without that, we're seeing response from vegetation naturally. We've got some milkweed, we've got some oak, uh, some manzanita, chaparral type environment, and then um, ferns. Ferns are coming back. So there's hope, right? There's hope moving forward that Mother Nature is taking care of itself already in some cases, and that's always very encouraging to see uh, that this is, this is happening without any doing of us, of humans. I mean, So that's the hill slope stuff. So now we, we went through the hydrology, the geology, and the soils. And then we sent other people out to say, okay, what about the roads? What about the trails? What about the archaeology, the cultural site, heritage sites, we call them? Um, what about the invasive weeds that might pop up? For example, you got a lot of dozer lines behind you now, tons of them. And weeds love fresh, disturbed soil. They'll come in, your yellow star thistle will come in and, and love that spot. So one of the treatment prescription examples that we might do for something like that me, is what uh, we call early detection rapid response. So we have people who regularly will monitor these areas and say, is there a weed here? And if so, I'll eradicate it, spray it or whatever they do to take care of that. So they're going to do that kind of stuff in these areas that have been disturbed. Um, Recreation is a big deal. I realize there's a ton of OHV trails in this forest, not just this district right here, but this whole forest. One of the things we noticed as we were driving around is, you know, these, these trails and these roads, forest roads, are in a forested area. So therefore, there are trees. And as you know, trees grow up straight, right? Above the surface. Below the surface, they go, the roots go all over the place. As the fire comes in and burns that tree, it likes to smolder and then it takes out the root ball. That root might go underneath the trail. In some cases, we've driven along, we've seen um, holes in a road or a trail already have formed. It might be three inches deep, it could be a foot deep, or it could be more based off of the, the size of that root ball. That's a real danger, and I've got a video showing some of that in a second here. So our engineering staff on this team, the recreation staff who have been over a lot of these trails and roads are looking at those, they're flagging them, they're making recommendations on how to solve that. One example on how to solve that might be that they find these spots where they see a root that's come underneath the road uh, surface, they might collapse it on purpose and fix it before some unsuspecting citizen drives over a motorcycle, a mountain bike, walking their own car, whatever, and falls in. So that's an example of what we could be doing here. Um, for the archaeology stuff, um, we don't typically highlight locations of where the, those sacred or sensitive sites are for archaeological reasons, um, but there have been barriers that have been destroyed and we might um, reconstruct some of those barriers, for example, to protect <coughs> those sites um, from future disturbance and destruction. Um, one example of one of the engineering, the roads treatments we might do and are pre uh, prescribing is because remember, a road is a critical value for the Forest Service. We want to keep roads open. We want to give you guys access to the forest and your private property up there and recreation opportunities up there. Um, the roads are a, a, a serious um, 
investment for the Forest Service and to maintain is a big deal. So when fire comes through, a lot of times you're going to have some increased runoff coming down the stream channel. And it's going to hit a road crossing. Well, the road crossing's usually got a culvert beneath the road, and it might be a foot in size or two feet, depending on how it's engineered, or smaller. We expect some of these to fill up. Either rocks or fallen wood or burn wood will come down and clog up that culvert on the upside, and the water will flood up and will back up behind it and then go over the road and potentially damage the road. So a trick we might prescribe is to pull a culvert, which sounds counterintuitive, but you pull it, and we do what's called harden that dip, either on the fill slope, which is down slope of the actual road, or in the dip itself, so that it stays um, as structurally sound as possible when the water does come down. We're not going to stop the water. We can't stop the water. We can, what we can do is mitigate for the risk of the emergency situation that will occur when the water hits that road. We also will add things like rolling dips. What happens here is as water comes down a hill slope, it, go on, it hits the road and wants to just go right down the road. It's a nice least path, least resistance path. And when it does that, over a long enough time, you get gullies. Real erosion, it's called. You start getting gullies in your road. None of us want that either. So a rolling dip is the engineer in, they actually build a slow little dip in the road, a rolling dip. Um, hopefully it's too noticeable in your car uh, or vehicle. And what it does is water comes down that road, hits that dip, and then it uh, gently goes off to the side onto the forest floor uh, instead of um, going down one spot particularly. So that's a, a common treatment we prescribe for engineering for roads treatments in um, on forests and fires like this. Because again, a lot of the stuff up the slope, not much we can do about that. We have a hard time stopping um, debris flows. Uh, we can't always stop floods from coming and uh, soil erosion, so we deal with the values that are below those kinds of risk, at risk areas. So here's an example of what you might see as you go out to the forest. Um, this is a video I took just a few days ago. Look at that root ball that's no longer there. So if half of that root ball, presumably, is gone, how's that tree standing? The answer is it might not be for very long, right? A tree at any time with the right wind or the right scenario or whatever, it might just go all over. Trees fall over all the time in the forest, right? But now there's a much higher probability of trees falling over because those, the root structure is gone a lot of these trees in these kind of high severity areas. So we've also had discussions as a um, safety discussions as our team is out, is even if we can get up a road and go visit a site, because there's no trees blocking the road, one can fall over behind us and trap us up there without a chainsaw if we didn't have one, for example. So even if you can get up there, getting out is still a second problem. We've had a lot of people go up a forest road and get stopped because there's a giant tree that could be three feet in diameter around there, and they just, they weren't equipped to deal with that, so they turn around and find a different route up to these areas. Common problem you might see for some time. That's why the forest is closed right now. It's a very dangerous situation in some of these areas, um, understandably so. The next one's the second video here of what a certain hill slope looks like. So the surface vegetation is largely gone. There's no ferns or grasses or small shrubs there anymore. Most of the organic material at the surface is being consumed by the fire, um, and there's hollowed out root balls throughout this area. So even as you're hiking through, you might step in one of these unsuspecting holes and all of a sudden you've got an ankle that's hurt or a leg that's broken or something like that. So please be aware, when you get up to the forest, whenever that time is appropriate, please be careful. Even, um, it might look fine, but uh, you just never know what's going to happen in these kinds of scenarios. Okay. So here's what the Forest Service has done from a scientific assessment. We looked at this part of the fire, we said, okay, here's what we think is going to happen in these kinds of scenarios. We presented treatment prescriptions to the local Forest Service office, and it's being submitted up the chain to our Washington office for funding. What happens is, once that gets approved, which might be less than a week's time, then the forest can immediately start implementing these treatments, because our objective from the bear perspective is to get these treatments that we think will lower the risk, the critical value, get those implemented before the first damaging storm. That's what we're trying to do. So they'll act pretty quickly on that. We'll try and get boat crews in as fast as they can to start uh, preparing the roads for the next storms um, and 
other protection measures that we've prescribed. Um, I want you to realize, like I said, the fire isn't out yet. As we drove through, I go the Elk Mountain Road all the way up to Pillsbury in the back out through Potter Valley, and we took one small diversion up towards Pine Mountain. Every 50, well, maybe every 50 yards or so, there's a burning stump in that road. This was just two days ago. So while the fire's contained over there, I don't expect growth over there, there's a lot of interior burning still happening. Some of that's very minor. Might, the flame length might be two inches higher. It could simply be a smolder. Charcoal basically smoking right there. That, that will happen until you have snow or significant rain to put some of that out. There's just too much for a firefighter to go out and find each tree and spray it with a hose, right? So there's a lot of danger out there. Um, there's a reason the forest is closed right now because uh, it's just not safe for people. We're out there because we have appropriate personal protection equipment. We've got hard hats and boots and radios and tools and uh, fire pants that don't catch fire as easy as your pants might, you know? Um, so please be aware of the danger that's out there. Understand why they closed the forest for right now, at least. Um, so that's kind of what the Bear team has done. What I want to do moving forward here is I want to ask Frank if he has anything he wants to say, and then I also will turn some time over to Corinne Woodard, who works for the Natural Resources Conservation Service out of Lakeport. Um, and each of them can talk about anything they want, actually. You can sing us a song if you wanted to. Um, and then after, yeah, keep this cabal on. And then after that, uh, we'll have time for questions and answers. And I, I certainly can answer all your questions. We've got lots of people here who can provide answers to some of those things. Um, no, the, the, the BEAR team, our focus is on forest service critical values. Um, there's not a lot that we can do by policy to private property outside the fire, for example. Um, so NRCS has more ability to deal with some of that stuff, but I'll let the experts talk about that. So. Frank, do you have anything you want to say? Yes. First, I'd like to thank uh, Dave, Jess, and the whole Bear team for coming out here. You know, this uh, this type of operation is really kind of um, complex and difficult. They're dealing with a whole uh, incident management team, the firefighters, all the hazards he talked about, trying to get their work done, and they have a very limited time to do it. It's a very rapid assessment. Uh, and they come in here, and they've assembled like 30 people, and they did just a wonderful job going out there and assessing the uh, the fire effects and staying safe. The bear team had no injuries that I'm aware of. Uh, so that's great guys. Um, gals. And uh, you know they did tap into local knowledge of course. You know they talked with me. They, they have a local hydrologist and wildlife person, also a local uh, botanist on the team. And of course uh, the engineers and recreation specialists, so a lot of those were local, tied in with other people that help in those specialties as well. So they were, they were here from out of town, but they were also working with all of our local folks that know the forest really well. Um, you mentioned it's been a horrible month. Well, Lake County's been a horrible four or five years, hasn't it? I mean, it's yeah. been, it's, it's, I mean, it's, uh, going to these cooperative meetings, I see the same people all the time. Uh, you know, Valley Fire, Pointing Fire, Clayton Fire, they said it, the list goes on and on. I'm not sure how much of, of Lake County is left to burn. Probably about 30%. Uh, it, it's, been, it's been a harrowing couple of years. Um, but as he says, the fire is, is, is not out, and it doesn't end when the fire is out. Uh, and that's what the Bear Team is all about, is we have a winter to get through here. And uh, the Bear Team is here to, to try and mitigate any of these hazards that we might have in this first winter, maybe a second winter, more likely just the first winter. Uh, and then the forest can move on and try, trying to find some more long-term long -term fixes and mitigations. Uh, it's just that we don't, we wouldn't have time to do that without the assistance of the Bear Team for this first winter. And uh, so they've done a great job. Uh, also want to say a lot of folks that who, who know me know that I started here in 2008 as a hydrologist on the district. So, you know, the watersheds here are really near and dear to me. It was uh, uh, my first job as a hydrologist was here uh, taking care of these watersheds. And so I've, I've been working very closely with them, as you can imagine, in their, in their analysis, because uh, it, it's, it's, you know, forefront of my mind from even the beginning of my career. Uh, they've done a great job. Um, there's treatments that they, they're prescribing that help us a lot with our roads and trails, and those are some very critical factors, not just for access to the forest, but as uh, most of you know, you get a plug culvert, washes out, now you've got you know, 12, 13 dump trucks full of sediment going downstream, and 
And so, you know, those, those roads are really important, just for, not just for access, but for the water quality as well. As, as Tom knows, and Jim knows, we've been through these discussions a lot. Um, so anyway, I want to thank you all for being here and coming in, and coming to uh, take the time and have the interest to see uh, what we're doing and what we're analyzing for post fire effects. Uh, I know it's, everyone's busy, so I really appreciate you coming here. And uh, I'll turn it over to Corinne. She's from the NRCS, working, of course, as many of you know her, working with private uh, landowners, and uh, she'll give you some information on how NRCS is involved. Probably you guys are tired of seeing all of our faces. It's been a little too much. Um, anyway, my name is Corinne. I'm with the Natural Resources Conservation Service. We are also part of the USDA, just like these guys. What was your mic closer? Can you hear you? Sorry. Um, and it's my job to work with private landowners on conservation, on agriculture, forest lands. And then, you know, I can provide information to you guys that may be just homeowners, but um, I just wanted to offer, since these guys are out there looking, you know, at the public land, and that's great, uh, but who's out there, you know, if you have questions on your, on your private land, um, you can call my office, um, and we will get something set up to, you know, try and answer any questions that we can for you, let you know some things that you can do, maybe some things you shouldn't do, um, and just give you some ideas for best management practices to recover, you know, whether it's forest, agricultural land, or just some, you know, kind of rural lands around Lake County. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody knew that we're here. I'm in, I'm in Lakeport in the Ag Building. Um, my cards are over there on the side. I put a few handouts on post-fire recovery over there. So um, just wanted to make sure everybody knew that I was there. Okay, um, so now it's open floor, open mic, right? Um, I do have a question that was submitted to me. I'll, I'll ask the experts to answer this, probably Frank in this case. What is the process for getting others, like a crew for tree removal, with a backhoe up onto someone's property? Yeah, so we, for a while we were only given permits to landowners to go in and assess their property just because of the hazards, plus we have a lot of equipment to put on the ground. Sorry, I was trying to use my outdoor voice. It wasn't outdoor enough. So for a while, we were only giving permits to landowners to assess their property. Uh, one of our big concerns was it's not just, we knew the fire was pretty cold out here, but the other hazards, trees, snags, and also all the heavy equipment that was moving up and down the roads doing suppression repair work, we didn't want that interfacing with public heavy equipment going up and down the roads. So now that that's kind of calmed down, we did start issuing permits today that the, the verbiage in it now is landowners or their designee. And uh, so if you've, got it, if you've gotten your permit already, you don't need to go back and get another one. I've already informed the law enforcement folks. Uh, hopefully they've all gotten the word. I, I know sometimes they, they don't get it up all straight. Um, but I've already informed them that we're not asking for new permits. But what you need to do, if you don't have a permit, please come to the Upper Lake office, show proof of ownership, you'll get your permit. And then when you have a contractor or somebody that's coming in to clean your uh, property, give them a copy of the permit and give them some form of documentation from you uh, that they are working for you. And so that they can get out there and help help clean. And, uh, permit for what? Tree, sorry? Permit for what tree removal? No, just for accessing the forest, uh, back, you know, getting into the forest. The forest is oh, closed. Oh, okay. And so you need a permit to actually get into the forest, okay. even if it's to your own private property, because you have to come through Forest Service land. Uh, so okay. we, we started that, we implemented that starting today, I think it was. Uh, so you should be good uh, to go. I know you're all anxious um, to get things cleaned up. And uh, if you have trees that you want to stop looking at to salvage log, or if you have other debris that needs to be cleaned up. And uh, I know it's a really sad time if you're cleaning up a, a house or a structure. I'm really sorry about that. but. Um, yeah, we want to try to make it easy and as quick as possible for everybody, but we did have some safety concerns at first, and now they're kind of alleviated, so. What questions do we have from the audience? Yes, sir. Do you think the Forest Service will have a program where they could offer at a reasonable price small fir trees to plant on their acreage to reforest? 
I had in the past years ago when I first moved here in the 70s, but I know money's different now. <laughs> um, we, we haven't, you know, as a forest, we haven't really looked into reforestation or what we're doing post, you know, as far as whether we're going to do salvage logging, forest, you know, forest treatments or anything. I suspect that we do have quite a bit of planting out there. Um, I don't know if the, the answer to your question as far as providing them for, uh, you know, reduced price, but what we can do if interested landowners want to kind of uh, work with the Forest Service, we do have what's called widen authority, which allows us to expend federal money on private land if it benefits the forest itself. And so if you have, for example, if you have a large chunk of land that's been completely burned up, um, and we're gonna be reforesting in that area, we could work with you to help reforest your area because it's gonna benefit the, the watershed that we manage. And so there's that option that we're looking at. Um, Identify large and then, Right, and then, and, our, and then Corinne has some more information as far as trees goes. I was just going to say that uh, reforestation on private land, um, you know, those people should contact me. Um, it does have to be a, about at least two acres, um, but uh, beyond that, those people should, should contact me um, and we can hopefully help you out. More additional questions? Yes, sir. Okay, if I live on a private road in the forest, do I need a permit to get to my home? Do you have to cross the forest boundary and drive on a forest road within the boundary of the national forest? No, it's, well, I cross forestry property, but the road is private. It's White Rock. Okay. White, White Rock King. No. Okay. No, because that's not a forest road. The closure order only keeps people off of forest roads, trails, and forest land. If you're oh, okay. not on or crossing forest road, trails, and land, then you, you should be fine. Okay, because it is a, I have a couple more questions, if it's okay. Yeah. Um, how isolated were the pictures you showed of the reforestation taking place as far as plant recovery, the ferns and the firs and stuff like that? How isolated that was, was that? Me. Yeah, that was, that was me. <laughs> I think all, all those pictures are mine. Um, they're in a variety of places. We've seen them on the east side towards Indian Valley Reservoir, is that what it's called? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm from Salt Lake City. I don't know this area that well. Um, some of the shrubs are coming back over there. We've seen up on Elk Mountain right on top with the ferns. Uh, they're kind of in various places throughout the forest and the various severity levels as well. Uh, our team's been out. We've, we've, I've got a map back in the office that shows 286 locations we visited in this general fire area. We've been all over the place and we're seeing this, not extensively obviously, but there's, there's certainly it's happening in a variety of places across the forest. Okay, last question. And I know it's premature, but are the forest practices going to change after this devastation? <laughs> Loaded question. Yeah. And I'm not a forest uh, management type person to answer that, honestly. I, um, I, not... I'm sorry for the question. No, that's fine. That's a legit question. And um, from the bear team perspective that I represent, uh, we're not looking at that at all. So I, I can't provide okay. much comment on Thank that. You. Okay. Sure. So the, you know, the Forest Service mission will always remain the same. Uh, you know, we'll be you know, protecting the, the, the National forests and grasslands for future generations. I don't remember. I should know the exact words, but I don't. Um, Punky, my TAO, is over there shaking her head at me. Um, <laughs> but you know, this is a game-changing fire. Uh, that's 400,000 acres of, of, of an incredible uh, change in, in what the forest is going to be doing over the next few years. We have not even discussed that as a forest. We're still in suppression mode and repair mode. Um, but it is game changing. We had, five, we had a five year program of work we were thinking about uh, doing over the next five years. Three of the projects on that five year plan just went up in smoke. So we're, we're going back and looking at um, this area and what we're going to do going forward. Certainly, we have some lessons learned. Um, you know, there's obviously, we've had some areas where we did some thinning and prescribed fire up on the Howard Mill area. And these are areas that we were in a maintenance burn phase, which is really nice to be in, where we're burning it every five, 10 years. 
and it did not burn up. Fire got into it, skunked around the bottom, little went out. So, you know, we're, we're, we're getting a lot of lessons learned from this fire, what treatments have worked, what treatments haven't worked. In fact, we have a, uh, a requirement nationally that if we have a fuels treatment on the forest land and a wildfire goes through it, we have to go in and, and evaluate the effectiveness of that fuels treatment. So we use those to continue to improve our, our, our ability to improve or you know, uh, restore the forest to a condition that will accept wildfire in a better condition. Thank you, Grant. I will say I drove through part of that area you just talked about, um, and it was pretty distinct to see we had a pretty moderate and that on you know, the higher end there of most of uh, the canopy consumed on one side of the road. On the right side where it had been thin previously, dramatically different landscape, but it was really encouraging for me to see that, that change. Question here. I had a, a question about the road small impact on the actual watershed response. So 
didn't make sense from an effectiveness standpoint for us to prescribe a treatment on a hill slope at all. Uh, that's just the way the, the bear process works in terms of its emergency, minimal, and temporary type of treatments that it prescribes on, on hill slopes. I worked on one of these teams uh, after the Valley Fire in 2015 and it was the state equivalent of a bear team. Um, in the debris flow potential, um, we were kind of shocked to see that, that all that was based on research in the Los Angeles forest, which has different geology, different vegetation, different hydrology, different rainfall pattern. Is that still the case that they've done anything for Northern California and other areas? I don't know the specifics of all the calibration that's happened on that model. I just know that they're constantly looking at that from the USGS <laughs> perspective. Um, almost all the Western fires in the US are using that same model. Um, I don't know all the sources of it, but it's a, at this point, it's the best model we've got for debris low potential. It's a perfect no. We weren't sure we agreed with it here. In fact, we thought it was a little overstated. I don't know if that's really going to happen or not. We'll, uh, time will tell with that. But the geologists who walked through the fire, uh, this burn area, uh, had other ideas there. Additional questions? Yes, sir. Um, the governor is talking about relaxing the permitting requirements for logging in burned areas. That state would the Forest Service, which is federal, um, do the same thing to allow logging, or would they keep the same restrictions that they have in place now? We we uh, so uh, we don't have anything going on right now that I know of. I mean, that's from the congressional level. Uh, we do have, you know, different things came out this last year, like the, the uh, uh, Farm Bill, which gave us a, a, a C, what's called a CE authority for certain operations. It's called categorical exclusion. It's just a lower level of environmental analysis. Um, we have a number of those that we can use in certain situations if it's wildlife improvement. Uh, there's also one that has an acreage, require, an acreage limit on it, but it's for um, reforesting natural vegetation. Um, there's nothing new that I know of that's coming down the pipeline, um, but we do have various different authorities and ways that we can try and minimize our need to do extensive environmental analysis and, and permitting. Well, if there is logging on my valley, we'll have to
it actually may be applied as a filter for water contamination. Could anyone speak to that? Yes, we have a Forest Service scientist at our Rocky Mountain Research Station in Idaho that has done extensive research on biochar. And the research is still kind of out on widespread applications. I don't know if you're talking about doing a filter system in Middle Creek or if you're talking about applying it on hill slopes, up on the hill slopes. But um, there's a lot of unknown secondary effects about what biochar does to soil chemistry and actually tying up nutrients instead of providing fertility. Um, there's a lot of research going on and the answers aren't really there yet. It, it's a promising thing as a soil amendment. It's very promising, but there's a lot of secondary effects that aren't really well understood yet. So I would say the science is kind of still out. What about charcoal? Like a log that provides a natural charcoal where bulldoze a log toward a very low level Yeah, this fire has just produced an amazing amount of charcoal out there <laughs> on the landscape. And not only above ground, but below ground. All those smoldering root systems we've been talking about, if they completely burn up, then you have this hole under the soil that becomes a danger to people. But if it doesn't completely burn up and it sits there and smolders, it's a big chunk of charcoal that's there underground. Does the charcoal, uh, since it's not processed, um, for the three hours we need to do it to do the biochar process, with the charcoal is more raw form, that's another unknown. One of the, the things that they don't know is they're producing biochar from all different species of trees and shrubs and different kinds of plants, and they're, they're different animals. And they're trying to get a handle on uh, biochar and charcoal that comes from different kinds of trees and shrubs, has different chemical properties. So again, the science is largely out on what, what is the best way to use biochar as a soil amendment. Study, it's, not being studied, uh, it's being studied very actively. Oh, it is. And as a soil scientist, it, it's a pretty exciting field to study, actually. Thank you. Yeah. One thing about the phosphorus, uh, the retardant. I know there are people in this county who are actively looking at water quality and the effects of the fire on that. And they, they're on it, they're studying, they're assessing the field right now and providing plans for um, how to deal with that at the treatment facility at the scale as well. We got time for one more question, then we'll wrap it up. Lake County News. Actually, I have several questions. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. Our, friend, our colleagues at the Mendocino Voice asked us yeah. some questions. Well, uh, yeah. The first question. The first question is: well, What are your predictions uh, for erosion problems from a literal perspective? The the, the statistical information is fascinating, um, but what are the literal impacts that you may have predicted for wildlife and uh, through the winter? as well as for uh, residential communities. So soil, wildlife, communities. And communities. What are you at, all three of those? Uh, that's just the first question. <laughs> so the, um, the, the only thing we can do with the soil, like erosion stuff, for example, is a prediction model. We don't know what's going to happen because it all depends on the storm event that comes through. It's, it's duration, it's intensity, and where it parks. Parks over a certain watershed has a different response than the parks over the watershed next door. So that's complete. It is all probabilistic and completely dependent on geography and local microclimate. So the secondary part of that question is, uh, what sort of weather forecasting models are you using for this winter? Can, can a hydrologist answer that question? I don't know exactly. I don't know what the soils folks use, but for hydrology, we use um, a typical two-year, 24-hour storm, um, kind of longer duration, typically what we see here. So yeah. we use that for soils as well, and we modeled a variety of storm events. And of course, our modeling is based on individual storm events, and over the course of the winter, you get different combinations of different storm events, and that's impossible to model, but we know what individual storm events of varying intensities will produce, and how that's gonna piece together over the winter, we really don't know. That's based on historical climate, what we will probably expect from the historical climate record. As we know, climate is kind of doing some funny things these days, so um, what we predict is uncertain and it is probabilistic. And they think the storm from that's a pretty common storm scenario, so it would happen somewhat regularly. If we model just for a 100-year storm, 
uh, you can see dramatic results in, every, you know, in that model the way to do that. And if you'll permit me, our colleagues at the Mencino Voices forward a couple of questions to us. Uh, and uh, the question initially is, are there any estimates of the mix of different kinds of land that the fire went through? That would be what types of woods, chaparral, uh, chaparral oak, uh, woodland, coniferous, et cetera. Yeah, that's a great question. I, um, was that in the 2500 burner uh, report? Like veg? Uh, I don't have that number on top of my head, and I apologize for that, but that is a common thing to look at as reported. It's in a report that's not in my hands. I apologize, I can't answer that right now. So we'll get back to you on that, and uh, perhaps we can also add to that to find out how the fire behaved in each of those different types of uh, environments. Yeah, that's a simple GIS operation, absolutely. And the last question, thank you very much, no problem. is uh, is there any is there any number uh, are there any numbers on the percentage of the fires that were uh, controlled by uh, fire operations or, or controlled burns? Yeah, how much the acres? Yeah. No, there's no way for us to tell from our assessment. We're looking at a satellite image and then go on the ground, and it doesn't differentiate between the source of the fire. Uh, we have no idea. Operation, the incident management team might have some sense of that, but if we don't. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're, we're at the end of time. has got a great answer for that, actually. Uh, what can an individual property owner do for erosion this winter? Give me a call and I'll come out and visit with you and take a look at your property and figure out what's best for your situation. Yeah, it's um, property specific, obviously. A lot of times doing nothing might be the easiest in the end, just as effective. Hey, thank you all for your time again tonight. Enjoy the county fair this weekend.